uh, I'd like to welcome you to the physics department. Um, as David said, I teach physics, and I shall be talking today about one little uh, branch of physics. Uh, but I thought it would be appropriate if we uh, started by deciding what physics is. I mean, that's what we teach here, but what is physics? Does anyone know what physics is? Anyone like to volunteer? Great. Study of movement. Study of movement. That is an excellent suggestion. That is one of the most important studies that physicists do. When we study movement, what we do is formulate laws. We, we discover laws that govern the way things move. Yes? Excellent. Physics is the Greek word for nature, and uh, we are studying nature. A anyone got anything else to say about it? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? It, it is actually rather hard to say what physics is. Uh, for instance, the word means the study of nature, but is physics the only th subject that studies nature? No. No, right. For instance, yeah. geology. geology, biology. So, first of all, uh, Physics is a part of science, isn't it? And science is really the study of nature, though, of course, the name got tacked onto physics sort of by mistake. Uh, so physics is a part of science, and what scientists do is to study nature, try to figure out how it works. So all scientists are after finding out how science works. So what distinguishes the physicists from biologists or chemists or something? That's a really tough one. Anyone got? Actually, what you said is, is, is right. Uh, one of the things physicists study is motion. And I think, more generally, what you can say is that physicists are interested in the really simple, basic questions. Um, how do things move? If I take this ball and throw it down on the ground, it bounces up again. Why does it? And more, what's more, as it moves down towards the ground, it goes faster and faster, it bounces around, and then it goes slower and slower. We want to understand why that is and how that works. There are a lot of other things physicists study. Any suggestions? You guys are doing just as well as my college classes. There's always a deathly <laughs> silence when I ask that question. Um, well, for instance, electricity. These lights around us are all powered by electricity, and physicists study electricity. And here's an interesting thing. Uh, when people started, stu physicists started studying electricity, which was about a thousand years ago, but mostly about uh, 200 years ago, they really began studying it, nobody had any idea that it would be any use to anyone. And yet now, we even can't imagine our lives without electricity. Electricity does everything for us. It runs our computers, it runs our kitchen stoves, it runs our refrigerators, it runs our garage door openers. So electricity was uh, originally a study of the physicists who just sort of wanted to know what's going on. But it turned out to be tremendously helpful. And that's another aspect of science, that it often turns out to be much more helpful than one could have imagined. Um, anything else physicists study? Well, oh, good. Beautiful. Atoms and molecules. I was longing for someone to say that. Uh, physicists study what atoms are and molecules are. Of course, you know what atoms are, right? What is an atom? Yes, tell us. Exactly so. Atoms make up molecules, and molecules make up everything. You and me, the air in this room, the walls of the room, and so on, we're all made up ultimately of atoms. They're the smallest little pieces of matter. And physicists are very interested in atoms. Any other suggestions? Yes? Actually, that's beautifully put. What he said was, aren't atoms the smallest elements, uh, smallest pieces of an element that still has the identity of the element? And that's a rather sophisticated point, but exactly right. You can actually pull an atom apart, but once you pull an atom apart, it sort of loses its identity. You know, an atom of, uh, let's say, hydrogen, you can recognize as hydrogen. If you pull it apart, it isn't really hydrogen anymore. Uh, th those are the sorts of questions that physicists study. Another suggestion. Energy. Beautiful. Energy and mass. Yes. Physicists are very interested in energy, and I'm going to talk a little bit about energy. Yes? They also study, like, statics. Statics. Perfect. Statics is the study of things that stay put. And that sort of sounds boring, doesn't it? I mean, things that stay put. It's, it's actually terribly important. If any of you are going to be architects, 
it is most important that you can build a building so that it stays put. <laughs> if the building you build doesn't stay put, you'll be fired from your job. So, very important aspect. Yes. We're going to study motion. We're going to talk about motion. The, um, the official name for the study of motion is a very mysterious name. It doesn't seem to make any sense, but it's called mechanics. So anyway, uh, we're going to be talking today about motion, or officially, mechanics. And uh, the, the uh, question, for instance, I mentioned one of the questions that physicists are very interested in is you take this ball, let's throw it up this time. When I throw it up, it goes slower and slower and slower, and then it stops and then speeds up down again. Um, why does that happen? That is a question about mechanics, and we're going to look at those sorts of questions. OK. Well. People have been interested in these questions for a, an astonishingly long time. The Greeks, about 2,500 years ago, were very interested in figuring out why do things move the way they do. And what they figured out is that there's some sort of connection between things that move and forces. And the Greeks puzzled long and hard about what is the connection between the force. I mean, what's a force? Yes. Excellent. A force is a push or a pull, isn't it? Right. You're standing in the, uh, in the playground at, at, at uh, um, recess, and uh, you, you, you're sort of annoyed with your friend, so you push him, and he falls over. So um, uh, pushes are an example of forces. Another uh, is it pulls, of course. It, maybe you're sorry for him then when he's fallen down, so you pull him up again, and th that makes him come up again. And so pushes and pulls are the prototype of forces. And forces obviously have something to do with motion. But what? The Greeks had thought about it, as I said, and they had reached a conclusion that turned out to be wrong. They had reached the conclusion that forces are basically what you need to keep things moving. Now, uh, let's have a look at that. It's easy to see why they thought that. You see, let's get this wooden block moving and see what happens if I let go of it. Well, it comes to a stop again. And if I want it to keep on moving, I've got to keep pushing, 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 pushing. So that's what they thought. Forces are what you need to keep things moving. And it wasn't until about 400 years ago, two or 350 years ago, that an Italian physicist called Galileo realized that I was wrong. And what he realized is that when that block comes to rest, let's see it happen again, I get it moving all right, but then if I don't keep pushing, it stops. What Galileo realized is that there's a force which is stopping it. What is the force that's stopping that? Oh, wonderful, look at all this, yes. Friction, Friction exactly. Friction, of course, is the force of roughness, in this case, between the wooden block and the table. And friction is pushing it back this way, and that, Galileo realized, is what stops it. Well, he went much further than that. He said, you know that if we got rid of most of the friction, then it would go much further before it stops. Now, uh, we can do that various ways. Let's just check that out. <clears throat> For instance, wheels are a good way to get rid of most of the friction, and I've got a little cart here, actually a very expensive cart, that has very little friction. And now if I push that, it's sort of spooky, isn't it? Because <laughs> what you're used to is that things grind to a stop pretty quickly. And that's because there's usually friction. But if you get rid of the friction, that is not the case. I want to show you another example of that, because it's something you might actually make for a science project, though I have to confess we didn't make this one. Uh, it, it's a little plastic disc with a hole drilled through the bottom. Some of you can see the little hole there. And we've connected the hole to a cork there. And then I'm going to inflate the balloon. Actually, before I say any more, this is sort of a model of what is called a hovercraft. Does anyone know what a hovercraft is? Fabulous, yes. Something that floats. Yes, it's something that floats and floats on air. Air, right. That's the point, isn't it? A hovercraft is a vehicle that can go over the ocean or it can go over land if the land isn't too rough. It's sort of like a boat and it has a, a, 
sort of jet engines of some kind, which shoot air down underneath its body, and the air pressure builds up underneath the body, and it actually lifts the whole body a little up off the ground. So then the, the, the vehicle can move across the ground or across the water with almost no friction because it's riding on a cushion of air. Right, well, uh, th we, this is our hovercraft, basically. I'm going to inflate the balloon, if I can. Okay, that's probably enough. Okay, and then I'm going to hitch the balloon over the cork, which has a hole through it, and a hole comes out the other side. So I'm going to keep my finger over the hole on the other side so the air doesn't get out. Some of it will get out anyway, I bet you. Mm. Surprisingly awkward to get this thing to go over the cork. There we go, I think. Okay, so now I've got my finger to stop the air coming out, but when we put it down on the table, the air will rush out the bottom of the... Uh, disc, and so the whole disc will rise up, you won't see it rise because it rises so little, but it'll then be resting on a cushion of air, like a hovercraft, and then off it goes. And what's fun about that is you could probably make it yourself. You notice it stops when it hits the seam there, but that's because of the force on it pushing it, oh, and it stopped when it ran into that lump of putty or something, and it'll stop if it falls off the edge. But other than that, I think it gives you a good sense that with very little friction, things go a very long distance before they stop. Now, Galileo went one step further. He said, if only we could get rid of all the forces, then surely it would go on forever. And we call that Galileo's law of inertia. And what he says is that things, if you don't exert forces on them, things just go on moving. It's actually sort of boring. They just go on and on and on and on, moving, if there are no forces. And that law was then adopted by a, an English physicist called Newton, and it's often called Newton's first law of motion. In the absence of forces, things just keep on moving. OK, so once you realize that, you realize that no forces is sort of boring. By the way, there are good examples of that. Uh, we have sent a spacecraft out to explore the solar system, and they've left the solar system. Now they're moving through space. There's no air resistance. There's very, very little gravity. No forces. So they just keep on and on and on. Same speed, same direction, forever. That's the law of inertia, or Newton's first law of motion. OK. So uh, we, we, we sort of lose interest in the situation where there are no forces. And we say, OK, let's study what forces do. And what forces do, of course, is change the way things move. If you want something to start moving, then you really do need a force. And if it's moving and you want it to stop, you need a force. So forces are what change the way things move. And I want to talk about one of the forces that we know well, what's called the force of gravity. That's just a name for the force with which the Earth pulls things down. The Earth, for example, is pulling this stone down towards it. How could I check that that's true? Yes? Drop it. Drop it, exactly. Oof, and off it goes. So uh, <clears throat> uh, it's clear that once I've stopped holding it up, there is something, let go, there's something pulling it down, and we call that gravity. Now, it's very interesting to study the way gravity works. And for instance, um, an interesting question is this. You know that gravity, you can feel it, pulls a big stone like this much harder than it pulls a little stone like this. So it's natural to ask the question, if you dropped them at the same time, would they reach the ground at the same time, or would the smaller one reach it first, or the bigger one reach it first? What, what do you think? They would reach the ground at the same time. Actually, that's right. Your reason wasn't quite right, was it? Because we know very well that gravity pulls harder on the big one. But it turns out it takes a bigger force to get a bigger thing moving, a heavier thing moving. And it turns out those two effects balance out. How shall we try find out if that's true? Drop them, exactly. Here we go. <laughs> OK. Well, <clears throat> um, uh, you might object. First of all, I suffer from a shaky hand, as you may have noticed. By the way, I should apologize for that. It always makes students sort of uneasy that my hands shake. I promise you, it is not that I party too much. <laughs> um, I was just born that way. 
It's interesting, my wife is very nervous about this, and about every five years she insists I go to the doctor to find out if there's something wrong with me. And it's always the same performance. The doctor does something weird, like hit my knee. And um, then he says, uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, um, he says it's a benign essential tremor which I like to say is the technical medical way of saying he hasn't the slightest idea what it is, but uh, <laughs> it's probably harmless. <clears throat> anyway, so my hands shake, so maybe I didn't release them together. And anyway, they didn't fall very far. It would be nice to see them fall farther, and that would obviously be a better test. So we've got a device here. Um, let's see, uh, I guess I need a helper for this. Excellent, why don't you come and give me a hand? And I want you to stand well back here. And don't pull on that string yet, particularly while I'm underneath it, because if you look at the top of the string, you'll see we've got a board there which is hinged uh, from, um, from that catwalk uh, railing there. And balanced on the board is a big ball, ball bearing, and a much smaller ball bearing. And uh, when uh, my helper, what is your name? Brady. Brady. When Brady pulls the string, the board will hinge down and it'll release the two balls at exactly the same moment and watch and listen for them to land when you're ready, Brady. Uh -oh. <laughs> Perfect. Right. Thank you. Um, very good. Uh, thank you, Brady. <clears throat> Excellent. Actually, that is misleadingly effective. You see, um, suppose I did this paper towel and a steel ball, hopelessly slow the paper towel. What's gone wrong? Oh, fantastic, you all seem to know. Excellent. Why not the lady there, the young lady there? Yes, you. Good. Perfect. It's got a great big area, so it cat as it moves down, it catches lots of air, so it feels a lot of air resistance. The steel ball also has a little air resistance, but so little you'd never notice it. But obviously, the paper towel catches lots of air, and w the person who discovered all this was Galileo again, and what he discovered is that if it's just gravity pulling things, then they all fall at the same rate. Uh, but, of course, it isn't just gravity in this case. Gravity is pulling it down all right, but air resistance is pushing it up. How could we check that that is the right explanation? Suggestion. Good. Uh, it's That's all right. Yes, let's crumple it up, because then, of course, there'll be less air resistance on the paper towel, won't there? So here we go. Almost together. Actually, um, it would be nice to see it dropped off the Leaning Tower of Pisa, which is what Galileo is supposed to have done. We don't have a Leaning Tower of Pisa, but we do have the Gamow Tower. And about 10 years ago, uh, we had a, a television series called Physics for Fun. New people are too young to remember that. But uh, in any case, we did do it off the Gamow Tower. And I'd like to show you a video of that at work. So let's put the screen down, turn off the board lights. And uh, when the screen is down, let's see the video of that experiment. Galileo discovered that if gravity is the only force acting, all objects fall at the same rate. All right, this time I think I got both you and Mr. Galileo. Explain this one. Well, you're quite right. The paper towel does fall more slowly. But that's because gravity is not the only force pulling on the paper towel. There's also the matter of air resistance. The steel ball feels almost no air resistance as it falls, but the paper towel has a large surface area. So when it's falling, it feels a large upward force of air resistance, and that's what slows it down. We can check that. If we scrumple up the paper towel into a small little bundle, then it'll feel much less air resistance, and now if I drop them, they should fall very nearly at the same rate. You know, the story goes that Galileo himself tried this experiment by dropping two different weights off the Leaning Tower of Pisa. We've got our own two different weights here, 16 pounds and 6 pounds, and we don't have a Leaning Tower of Pisa, but we've got our Gamow Tower here at CU Boulder, and let's try dropping them off the top. Okay. At the top of the tower, Professor Taylor loaded the balls onto a platform that would release them at the same time. From there, 
the pictures tell the story that Galileo was right. Ready, set, go! What's the password? Actually, uh, we can do more complicated experiments. We could ask, for example, what ha would happen if I took two things, a uh, ball and a stone, and I dropped one, but I threw the other one out sideways. So the ball that I dropped would go straight down, but the stone would follow a much longer path like this and come down here. In that case, which would hit the ground first? Uh, let's see. Yes. The steel ball. I think that's very reasonable, isn't it? Because the steel ball has less far to go than the stone. But I think they both will hit the ground at the same time because both have the same uh, because both have the same uh, gravity accelerating them down. The, so the a movement sideways doesn't really matter. It affects how fast it falls. He should give this show, shouldn't he? <laughs> Terrific, thank you. Yeah, it is true. It turns out that gravity pulls them down at the same rate, even if they're moving sideways. Now, that's very tricky to do. You can go out into the playground and practice with a couple of stones, but it's tricky to do. But I've got a device that will do it for me. Here it is. Um, those of you who are close in at least can see it pretty well. There's a, a black metal base there and I've got two balls, and on the metal base there is a bar that runs across, and it's spring-loaded, so I'm going to move it across to the left and put down the trigger there, and so that holds it, pushed to the left, so the bar is sticking out a bit on the left, and it's ready to fly out on the right, and what I need to do is check that it is level, because I don't want to cheat, I want to be sure it will throw the ball out uh, level, now I'm going to put one of my balls on the plate here. So now when I pull the trigger, the bar will fly out to the right and throw that ball. Meanwhile, this ball has a little hole in it, so I can thread it on this end of the bar. And when the bar flies to the right, this ball will just drop straight down. So it's kind of hard to watch them both, but you can listen, so be very quiet, and let's hear them hit the ground at the same time. Ready, set, fire! Oh, it didn't fire. Try again. Ready, set, fire. Oh, OK. So it turns out the sideways motion doesn't change the fact that the downward motion, thank you, is just gravity pulling it down. We've got another example of that. Um, I'll get the screen out of the way. This is a tragic tale, the danger of too much learning, uh, uh, too little learning, I mean, a little bit of learning. <clears throat> it's the story of a hunter and a monkey. The monkey is up in a tree. There he is. And there is a hunter down here on the ground who is clearly a very mean person because he decides to shoot the monkey. Now, he points his gun straight at the monkey in the naive expectation that when he fires the, the dart or whatever it is that's going to come out of it, that uh, dart or whatever it is will come out like this, traveling in a straight line, and hit the monkey. Now, of course, you and I know that's wrong, don't we? What is that dart really going to do? Good. Back there. And say it again. Yes, it, instead of going straight to the monkey, it's, uh, where's it gone? Straight to the monkey, it's going to curve downwards, isn't it? Because gravity is going to be pulling it downwards. So if the monkey only knew it, he's safe. Because uh, when the hunter fires, incidentally, I was once criticized for suggesting that when somebody points a gun at you, you should stay put. <coughs> Uh, that is not true. If the gun fires an extremely fast bullet, then in fact it will follow so nearly a straight path that it will hit you anyway. But this guy's just uh, got some sort of poison dart or something, I don't know, and so it's going quite slowly, so we know perfectly well what's going to happen. It's going to curve like that and miss the monkey. Now the trouble is, the monkey sees what's about to happen and says, I'd better get out of the way. And he says, I'm not going to drop now, because then the hunter will just shoot me on the ground. 
I'm going to wait till the moment the hunter shoots, and then I'm going to drop. <laughs> now think what happens. You see, gravity is pulling the bullet down, and gravity is pulling the monkey down now, and they're both in flight for the same amount of time. So the monkey winds up just as far below his original position as the bullet does. So the tragic thing is, they'll meet in mid-air. So um, we can show you that. Uh, what we've got here is, first of all, here's the gun. It is powered by air pressure, which is fed in at the back of this steel barrel here. And I'm going to load the gun with a ball bearing. So you can just see, some of you, the silver ball bearing. And then I'm going to close a little switch here, and that little switch turns on a current which powers an electromagnet up there, a magnet which will hold up the so-called monkey. So now we're ready to put the monkey up in the tree. By the way, when we did this for physics for fun, Channel 4 said, that is too horrible for you to shoot a monkey. Um, and so we had just to call it a falling target. I thought that was a little hypocritical, coming from a, uh, a station that showed us, shows us murder and mayhem in the supermarket every day. But anyway. And you notice how the monkey immediately turns himself sideways. Uh, so uh, it's going to be harder to hit him. But let's see, I'll try and get him straight. Good. OK. Good enough, anyway, I hope. So there's the monkey up in the tree. Now, let's see what's going to happen. <clears throat> so the gun is now loaded. We must make sure it's pointing at the monkey. Now, I can check that with a laser beam that we've got here. Whoops. Actually, let me just get this. That's got, uh, let's try again. Oh, Lord. <laughs> and now the laser beam, you notice, is not on the monkey. But let's bring it around. There it is. Uh, OK, right through the heart. Um, actually, I don't quite trust that the laser beam is aligned with the barrel, so I'm going to look through the telescope. And actually, um, I'm just going to tweak it a little bit. Let's try that again. I'll turn on the laser beam. That looks pretty good. OK. So now, when we pull the trigger, that will release the air into here, which will throw the bullet out. As it goes out, it'll open that switch. So at the very moment that the ball bearing leaves the barrel, the monkey will start falling. Now I just need a heartless volunteer to pull the trigger. Uh, <laughs> good. Uh, how about the young lady in the uh, striped shirt there? And we've got your hunter's hat to put on. <clears throat> good. So there's the trigger. So ready, set, fire! Oh! <laughs> very good. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, well, <clears throat> gravity is just one example of a force. And there are lots of kinds of forces. And one of the things scientists like to do is study things in general. I, I mean, certainly they're interested in gravity, but they're interested in electric forces, and they're interested in pushes and pulls and so on. And so we spend a lot of our time trying to talk about any old force. And there are lots of interesting questions you can ask. For example, <clears throat> if you have two forces, suppose, for instance, your car is stuck in the parking lot, and you're trying to push it with a force of 100 pounds, and uh, it, you're not moving it fast enough to satisfy yourself, then you call in a helper. I come along. Suppose I push with the same force, another 100 pounds, in the same direction. What will that do? Two of us pushing with a force of 100 pounds each. Any suggestions? Yes? Exactly so. We'll have a force, a total force, it'll be just the same as if one person was pushing it with a force of 200 pounds. Now, if you think about that for a moment, that's very interesting. Because what it says is that forces obey the rules of mathematics. 100 pounds plus 100 pounds is 200 pounds. Now, that's an astonishing thing. Nobody knows why it's true that nature obeys the rules of mathematics. Um, you can say various things, but in any case, it does explain why your teachers spend lo such a lot of time trying to persuade you to understand mathematics. Because, in fact, you can't understand science if you don't understand mathematics. So that's an interesting point. OK, so 100 pounds plus another 100 pounds in the same direction is like 200 pounds. 
What if I'm really stupid and go around to the front of the car and I push back with a force of 100 pounds? Yes? The car won't move. That's right. Uh, the, the, the effect on the car, as far as its motion is concerned, will be no force at all. So 100 pounds one way and 100 pounds the other way on the same object uh, cancel out, as it were, and it's just like no force at all. Okay, and those two ideas, they seem obvious, but they, they explain a lot of interesting things. For example, here I am standing on the floor. Now, I weigh about 200 pounds. That means gravity is pulling me down with a force of 200 pounds. Luckily, the floor responds by pushing up with a force of 200 pounds. And so I don't move either way, because it's just as if there were no force at all on me. And uh, so that explains a lot of things. When my son went off to college, which was a long time ago now, he, he foolishly packed all his books in one case. So it was just ridiculously heavy, much too heavy for one person to carry comfortably. But two people could carry it, and that's because, I don't know, remember, but maybe it weighed 100 pounds, and then each person could lift with a force of 50 pounds, and 50 plus 50 would be 100, and that would be enough to balance gravity pulling it down with a force of 100. It explains the bed of nails here. You know, when I was a child, I remember so clearly thinking that Indian fakers who uh, lay nearly naked on a bed of nails understood something about um, mind over matter. In fact, they just understand some very simple physics. Think about it. Um, let's imagine we have a 200-pound faker and a bed of one nail. Here's our 200-pound faker lying on a bed of one nail. How hard does the nail have to push him up? 200 pounds, right? Exceedingly uncomfortable even to think about. Two nails, each nail only has to push with a force of 100 pounds. Uh, 200 nails, each nail pushes with a force of just one pound, doesn't it? So it's much easier with 200 nails. By the way, one pound is still exceedingly uncomfortable to be pushed with by uh, 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 a nail. But what we've got here is uh, just your regular old bed of nails with uh, 2,000 nails in it. And so <clears throat> each nail has to push with a force of a tenth of a pound. Okay, so the only thing you have to be careful with on a bed of nails is not to throw yourself down. <laughs> Sorry about the sound system. Here we go. Okay. And actually, the fact is, it's embarrassingly comfortable. <laughs> it's hard to know that there are any nails pushing into one because each is pushing so gently. Okay, so that is an illustration of one of the fundamental problems. Thank you. There isn't a lot of your mind. Did someone like to try? No obligation to take off your shirt. <laughs> Who'd like to try? Oh, good, you'd like to try. Excellent. Sure, I'll put on my shirt and make myself decent again. The next question about forces, uh, the forces, you'll notice the forces we've been talking about so far have mostly balanced out. The downward force of gravity here was balanced by the upward force of the nails, so the people lying on the bed of nails didn't in fact uh, move. But it's much more interesting to ask how much does a force, which is not balanced out, make things move? And the person who discovered the answer to that question was Newton, the one I mentioned before. Uh, the law of inertia was Newton's first law of motion. Newton's second law
is the answer to the question, how much does an unbalanced horse make something move? Actually, we can ask it a little more exactly than that, because if a thing is stationary, a force acting on it, unbalanced, will make it move. If it's moving, then it can do several things. If you push the right way, it'll move faster. If you push the wrong way, it'll move slower. So what forces do is change the motion of things. So what Newton discovered was this, that the change of motion of something or other, that car that you're pushing on, is equal to the force that acts on it multiplied by the time for which the force acts. And there's another interesting thing. You notice you have to be able to multiply to use Newton's laws of motion. And that's why your teachers nag you about learning to multiply. OK, well, I, I want you to look at that. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting statement. It says the change in a way thing moves will depend on how hard you push it. The harder you push it, the bigger the force and the bigger the change in motion. But also, the longer the time for which you push it, the more the motion will change. Or to put it another way, the shorter the time for which you push it, the less the thing will move. And that is often very interesting. Um, by the way, I should say that uh, I mentioned, uh, I used the word motion here. The technical word for that is actually momentum. So those of you who are science buffs should say the change in momentum is the force times time. And the momentum of a body that's moving around is actually just the mass of the body. That's sort of how heavy the body is, multiplied again by how fast it's going, its speed. And so uh, technically, that's what we're worrying about. But the top line is all we really care about. And I want to use it to explain a couple of things. First of all, the celebrated trick whereby the lazy waiter has to remove a dirty tablecloth from, un uh, from a tabletop, and he's too lazy to remove the china first. How does he pull the tablecloth out without moving the china? Yes? Faster because if it was slower, then it would break the china because it would come off quickly. Perfect. He has to pull it fast in order that it leaves the china behind. Now, I think that's quite surprising, actually. It's absolutely right. But I think, personally, it's quite surprising. And you know, to understand why it works, we need to understand first why it doesn't work if you pull slowly. So let's imagine uh, we're a stupid waiter, and we pull slowly. And of course, the, ch the china moves just as fast as the tablecloth. So I'm not going to have the tablecloth off until the china comes off as well, and it'll all be broken. OK. so. Um, Let's have a picture of that. Here's that bottle of champagne, or whatever it is. And here's the tablecloth. And here's the waiter pulling on it. And now, let's agree first. What makes the bottle move? And let's agree, that has to be a force, doesn't it? We've seen that you need a force to make something which wasn't moving start moving. And what is the force that makes the bottle start moving? Yes? Friction. friction, fantastic, yes. So, excellent. Um, the friction between the tablecloth and the bottle, the tablecloth is being pulled this way, so the friction between the tablecloth and the bottle pulls on the bottle to the left. Okay, so that's friction. What makes the tablecloth move? Yes? The waiter, exactly. So it is the force that the waiter exerts on the tablecloth. Let's draw that in. There's the force of the waiter pulling on the tablecloth. Now, here's the point. It's always the same old friction that is going to make the bottle move, but the waiter can vary how hard he pulls. Now, the harder he pulls, the more quickly the tablecloth will move. Meanwhile, it's the same friction that is making the bottle move. And the change in the motion of the bottle is the force, that's friction as far as the bottle is concerned, times the time. Now, if the waiter pulls hard enough, the tablecloth will start moving faster than the china, and so it'll slide out from underneath. 
and the harder the waiter pulls, the quicker it'll slide out from underneath, so the shorter the time to which the force is acting on the china. So same force, whatever, friction, but shorter and shorter time, the harder we pull the tablecloth. And so, the harder we pull the tablecloth, the better the chance that the tablecloth will move from underneath the china, leaving the china nearly unmoved. Now, <clears throat> unfor the unfortunate thing about science is, if you have a theory like that, you've got to test it. And this always makes me nervous, but here we go. There we are. <clears throat> And you notice that it did move, it just moved very little, because there was very little time for the force to produce a change in motion. Well, there's another trick that kind Mike, and by the way, uh, Mike, could you come up here for a moment, because I want to introduce Mike. Mike Thomason <coughs> is the person who is actually in charge of all this wonderful equipment we have here in physics, and it is he who really makes these physics demonstrations possible, so I'd like you to give Mike a hand. <coughs> But what Mike is going to do, much against his will, is um, a break a block of concrete on me. <clears throat> and the question is, why is that possible? So, uh, thank you, Mike, that's great. Let's have a picture of the concrete block. And here am I, lying underneath it. And it, it, concrete blocks, by the way, are exceedingly strong. And it takes a tremendous force to break a concrete block. But they are also very brittle. So if the hammer hits the concrete block hard enough, the concrete block will break instantly. Which means, of course, that the hammer stops pushing on it. So once again, we've got the situation that, that now there's actually a rather big force, but for a very short time. And so the block scarcely moves at all, and the consequence is the theory is, at least, that it doesn't hurt me. <clears throat> okay, well, I, I'm going to lie down, and then kind Mike will put the block on my chest. And, uh, good. So actually, first of all, I'm going to put a towel over my face, because two things, it makes it look better. <clears throat> and the other thing is, there is a tiny flaw in the argument. A little sliver of the concrete block could actually move quite fast. So it's a good precaution to cover my face. Great. And then... Right. You must have missed your ribs. Good. Good. Got there? All right. Excellent. How does that feel? It feels heavy, <clears throat> <laughs> but very comfortable. Doesn't let you in. Mike, I didn't take my watch off, did I? No watch. Good. Excellent. Yes. <laughs> and a boy, wow. Fantastic. Thank you, Mike. Terrific. <coughs> Beautifully done. Well, it makes a horrible mess, but there we are. Good. Okay. So, where are we? Oh. I just wanted to show you one more trick that's really the same as the tablecloth and china, but you can do at home. And uh, I, with my shaky hand, uh, am not very good at it, so I, I use a very big bottle. And so here's a big bottle. And what you can do is take an index card and put it on top of the bottle, and then put something like a dice on it. I've actually got a cork here, a cork which is weighted, which makes it easier. But anyway, now I'm just going to flick the card out from underneath. And I may or may not do it successfully, but you get the idea. The harder you flick it out from underneath, the quicker the uh, card will be out from under the dice or whatever it is you have here. So the idea is it'll fall into the bottle. Let's give it a try. Here we go. Oof, there it is. In it goes. So that's sort of fun to try. Thank you very much. Good. So that's something for you to try at home. <clears throat> Well, we've got a few more things to show you. Um, th that is all Newton's second law. He had a third law. He had three basic laws of motion. And the third law of motion um, says a curious thing. Um, first of all, you've got to recognize that whenever there is a force, um, 
there must be something exerting the force. So force is always exert, uh, in, involve two things. A hammer hits a nail. Well, the nail is experiencing the force of the hammer, but the hammer is exerting the force. So there are always two things. And what Newton realized is that there's a sort of back and forth relationship between those. If the hammer exerts a force on the nail, then like it or not, the nail exerts a force back on the hammer. Now actually when you think about that for a moment, that's very reasonable, isn't it? Because the hammer pushes the nail into the wood, but the hammer stops. And what stopped it? It was the force of the nail pushing back on the hammer. So there's this relationship. Newton called the two forces the action force and the reaction force. And what he realized is that the action force and the reaction force are actually always equal. They're equally big in the opposite direction. Okay, so um, I can show you that various ways, uh, it, some pretty simple ways. For example, suppose I push on this table here. Well, obviously I'm pushing on the table, and if the table weren't well anchored, it would move, and actually it feels suspiciously as if it might move any moment. Um, but if the table weren't pushing back on me, what would happen in this position? Yes? I'd fall flat on my face, right. And so there's no doubt about it. I'm pushing the table, but like it or not, the table's pushing back on me. Well, actually, we can check that. Um, these skateboards were made for, I call them adult skateboards. Actually, we're in a little trouble because we've got all bits of concrete all over the place, but maybe we can put it back here. Good. Now, I need a volunteer. <laughs> it's so great, you know, when you ask for a volunteer from a university class, dead silence. They all look down at their notebooks. And here, everyone wants to come. Um, how about you? Would you like to come and give me a hand? Great. I want to show you that... Um, I've got to get away from all the fragments of concrete. Um, good. I want to show you... Um, that exerting a force on me will cause me to move. Now, the trouble is, in general, if I just stand... What is your name? Molly. Molly. If I just stand here and Molly pushes me, friction will stop me from moving. So I'm going to get up on this cart, which has frictionless wheels nearly. Molly, would you mind holding my hand? It's a little hard getting on these carts. They move so easily. Now, what I want you to do, Molly, is put your hand on my hip, both hands, if you like, and give me a, just the biggest push you know how. Excellent. Off we go. And I start to move. No big surprise, of course. But what I want you to recognize is that putting someone on a skateboard like this gives us a wonderful way of demonstrating forces. If I start moving, it's because there was a force on me. Why didn't Mo Now, Newton claims, of course, that when Molly pushed on me, I exerted a force back on Molly. Why didn't Molly move? Uh, that's really the point, isn't it? That it? She wasn't on a cart like this, so there was friction between the floor and Molly's shoes, and so Molly didn't move. So, good, we'll put Molly on a skateboard. <laughs> so, now we'll both be on skateboards. Now, this is a little trickier. Whoops. All right, we'll hold hands, and I'll steady us both on this until we're ready. Now, actually, Molly, why don't you move yourself so you can give me a great big push again? That was an excellent push you gave me before. But you'll have to move a little closer, I think, and get both hands on my hip so that you can give a big push. When we're, well, not yet. Sorry. <laughs> okay. When we're ready. I'm going to let go now. And now I want you to watch carefully what, exactly what happens. But Molly's going to push me, and that'll make me move. But watch what happens to Molly. Okay. Good big push. Excellent. Now, I hope you noticed first that Molly, of course you noticed Molly moved, and that's because there was a force on her. What was it? It was the Newton's third law force. If Molly pushed me, like it or not, I exerted a force back on Molly. But did you notice that she moved faster? And that's because she has less mass. She's less heavy than I am, surprisingly enough. And <laughs> consequently, the same force produced more motion in Molly than it did in me. Well, super. Thank you so much, Molly. That was terrific. <clears throat> <clears throat> and actually, I just want to show you one more thing. Newton's um, third law explains how rockets work. Rockets can be hovering in outer space where there's nothing to push on, and lo and behold, they can start moving. 
And the way they do it is they start up their motors, and their motors use fuel, and that fuel, um, when it's burned, they throw out the back. So they throw the fuel out the back, that pushes the fuel backwards, but then, in, by Newton's third law, the fuel pushes the rocket forwards, and off goes the rocket. So I'll just show you that. It's pretty feeble, but you can get the idea. <clears throat> uh, so what I've got here is a couple of these uh, medicine balls that are quite heavy. <clears throat> so they represent the fuel of this rocket, and I represent the motor of the rocket. So <clears throat> when I hurl the fuel out the back, the spent fuel, I have to push it to the right, so it pushes me to the left. Let's try it. <laughs> Not very dramatic. Could you very kindly give me that back again? Um, if I want to move faster, of course, I've got to throw out more fuel. So here we go. One fuel, two fuels, and actually, I move a bit. Well, pretty feeble. And what it shows you is that if you want to make yourself move that way, you've got to throw a lot of fuel out the back, which is why the space shuttle, have you ever noticed, the space shuttle is actually itself quite a modest vehicle, but before it takes off, it's enormous, because it has these huge fuel tanks strapped onto it. And that's just so that it has lots of fuel to throw out the back and make it move forwards. Good. Um, I want to show you just two more things. Um, the first concerns the idea of energy. Energy is this fantastically important concept uh, associated with motion. Momentum is associated with motion, but so is energy. When things move, they have a kind of energy which we call kinetic energy. But there are many, many different kinds of energy. There is, for example, gravitational potential energy. And when I lift a rock up, it has more gravitational potential energy. And we can test that by letting go of it. And Indeed, that gravitational potential energy actually gets converted back to kinetic energy as it goes down. Lots of sorts of energy. Chemical energy, uh, for instance, gasoline has chemical energy in it, and we use the chemical energy which we burn in the cylinders of our car to make the car roll forward and give it kinetic energy. So energy is this important idea. It's an important commodity. It can change its form, and that is uh, the thing I want to show you. I want you to think about a pendulum. Uh, wait a moment. Uh, OK, let's have the pendulum over here. There's a great big pendulum. We've got a pendulum here, you see. Uh, OK, this wire holding a bowling ball. And uh, what I have, uh, I'm going to do in a moment, uh, it, 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 it's sitting at the moment down here, but I'm going to lift it up. By lifting it up, I give it some more gravitational potential energy. And then when I let go of it, Lift it up, now I let go of it, and that gravitational potential energy changes back to kinetic energy here. And by the time it's got here, it's moving, so it overshoots, and then that kinetic energy is changed back into gravitational potential energy again. And then lo and behold, it swings back, so it's become kinetic, now it's mostly potential, now it's mostly kinetic, now it's mostly potential. So you're, what you're witnessing there is energy changing its form. And what I want to ask first is, uh, by the way, the gravitational potential energy of something depends on how high you have lifted it. I, when I pull it back like this, I'm lifting it up higher. And so suppose I lift it up to here and release it. Then, of course, it swings down. By now, all that potential energy I gave it has become kinetic energy. It's moving. So now it swings up. By the time it gets to the top of its swing, it's lost all its kinetic, and it's all back to potential again. So how high does it go here compared to how high it goes here? Mm. Yes. Same, exactly, perfect. Right, because uh, it, it, all its potential energy that it had here was lost to kinetic here, but then it all goes back to potential, so it comes back to the same height. So now it swings back. How high does it come when it gets back here? Yes. Same height. Good. OK. Now, one of you two people clearly needs to volunteer bravely to show that principle. Yes, let's take you, and we're going to put you on this chair here. And if you'd like to sit on that. <clears throat> now. Excellent, good. 
<laughs> OK, so uh, when we release it, it'll swing down, go up the same height on the far side, swing back again, and come to exactly the same height. <laughs> Do you believe, what, what's your name? Emma. Emma. Emma, do you believe that? Uh, yeah. Good. Excellent. Okay. Here we go. Off we go. Don't lean forwards. Off we go. Oh. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> well done, Emma. <laughs> Excellent, Emma. Thank you very much. <laughs> Actually, those of you who are close in will have noticed that it didn't quite come back to Emma's chin again, did it? Where did that extra energy go? It didn't quite get back all its potential energy. Uh, yes? It was lost in, uh, in friction, uh, in fr by friction, by it friction. Thermal, thermal energy. And Fran also there's another thing. Good, excellent. You calculate how fast it goes by, by saying, that, and the, by saying that, you, that you can find the equation that the potential energy is equal to the kinetic energy, and then you can find out that the speed is. Fantastic, right. Uh, first of all, it, it is true that there is a little bit of air resistance as that pendulum swings, air friction as you called it, which is perfect, and that actually converts a little bit of its kinetic energy into heat energy. And so when it came back, it didn't quite get back all its potential energy, so it didn't quite reach Emma's chin. And the other thing is, you can actually use this to calculate how fast it's going to be going in the middle, but we won't take time. Perfect, yes. Uh, you're going to give the lecture next year. <clears throat> um, one more thing I wanted to show you. I'm quite proud of this demo because it's actually a demonstration of the principle of relativity. Who invented the principle of relativity, does anyone know? Uh, I know you know. Um, <laughs> yes, in the yellow cap? Einstein. Einstein, right. Einstein was perhaps one of the two greatest physicists of all time. It's hard to say a thing like that, of course, but I think Newton and Einstein take the prize together. And Einstein lived um, in the 20th century, and end of the 19th century, uh, first half of the 20th century, and he invented this principle of relativity, which says, roughly speaking, this is a very loose statement, but it says that you can do your physics from various different points of view. And I'm, I'm going to explain what I mean by that in a moment. But this particular demo involves something which we call an elastic collision. This ball is going to collide elastically, as we call it, with the floor, in fact. And I want you to watch what happens. It bounces back, and it turns out in an elastic collision, it bounces back going just as fast as it went in. Now, how did I know that it was going very nearly as fast coming out as it went in? Yes? Excellent, because when I dropped the ball, it came back to the same height. It actually didn't quite, did it? And you saw that. I had to go just a little bit lower to catch it. But to the extent that it came practically back to where it started, it's clear that it lost potential energy. It became kinetic. It turned around. It was kinetic. It lost that, and it came back to the same height with the same amount of potential energy it started with. So not all collisions are elastic. We've got another basketball here. Watch this collision. And we purposely deflated it, of course. And so that isn't an elastic collision. So by no means are all collisions elastic, but there are quite a lot of elastic collisions around. And <clears throat> um, I've got another thing that'll do the same thing. I've got this little super ball here. Here we go very nearly to the same height, so an elastic collision. Now, actually, what we're seeing here is an elastic collision between a light thing, both of these are pretty light, and a very heavy thing, the Earth, in fact. And in uh, those sorts of collisions, what we've discovered is true, uh, that the light thing comes in, and however fast it's going when it hits, it turns around and comes out going as fast. So that's a rule that we've discovered, and actually uh, our students, and I expect you could too, could prove that it's going as fast. We could prove that it's going as fast when it comes out as when it goes in. Okay, I want to ask a much more difficult question, which is, if the big ball were also moving, so here's the big ball, and it were coming up as fast, well, wait a moment, um, I should say something else. 
the big ball is, of course, quite a lot heavier than the little ball, so if I could do it, and I don't know how to do it, if that could be just floating here, I could drop the little fellow down, and it would bounce back going just as fast when it came out as when it went in. So uh, this ball is much heavier than this little ball, and so our rule would apply to those. So um, that's easy. But now, what happens if they're both moving? How fast will the little chap bounce back? Twice as fast, I the same speed? Yes. Same speed. I think that's a reasonable guess. Twice as fast. Ah, OK. L let's agree that that baseball, the basketball, is very well inflated, so it's really hard. So it really would be an elastic collision, but it's going at the same speed as the little chap coming in. Yes? Well, it probably would be more, actually. It is, in fact. Uh, yes, and energy. You're right, you're right. But actually, I'm going to offer you an easier argument. It turns out it goes three times as fast. And that, uh, we can get that various ways. We could use, as he suggested, the principle of conservation of energy and momentum. But I'm going to use the principle of relativity. Let us take the point of view, not of you and me, as you and I see this, that's moving up, that's moving down. But let us instead take the point of view of a spider that happens to be sitting on the big ball as it comes up. Now, from the point of view of the spider, the big ball is at rest. I mean, there he is lounging around on the big ball, and as far as he's concerned, it's just sitting there. But he looks up and sees this ball. Let's call it speed v. That's the usual symbol that denotes v. Uh, this was going down at v. This was coming up at v. But the spider looks up at the little ball, and how fast does he see the little ball approaching him? Yes. Two times v, right. That's just what happens on the, the highway, for example. If you're going at 60 miles an hour, and you see a car coming towards you, which is also traveling at 60 miles an hour, you see it approaching you at 120 miles an hour. So when the spider looks up, he sees this ball coming down with twice the speed that either one is seen moving by you and me. OK, now he knows the rules. This is a great big heavy ball, and a little ball is approaching it at 2v. So how fast does he predict it will bounce back? Twice as fast, right? It goes in as fast as it comes out. So as seen by the spider, the little ball ricochets back at twice the speed he saw it coming in. But that's as seen by the spider. And of course, you and I know that the big ball is already going up at speed v, and the little ball is streaking away from the big ball at 2v. So as you and I see it, it's going to be streaking away at 3v. Well, that's a tricky argument, and so if you didn't follow all the details, that's OK. But I want to show you that it's true. And we've got this wonderful Jurasticus, which we made some years ago. And we thought we'd lost last night, and my heart was broken. But we've got a, a lever here. And I'll hang it up like that. And then we've got a second lever here, which I'll hang from the first. And then I'm going to balance the balls on the ends of the levers. So there's the big ball, and here's the little ball. Now, let's think what happened when that string is released. Uh, both levers are going to flop down, just the way that platform did there. So both of these balls are going to fall towards the floor. And of course, this one's going to win because it's got a head start. So it'll hit the floor going at a certain speed, turn around, come up at the same speed. So this ball will be going down when it meets this ball coming up, both going at the same speed. And they'll have an elastic collision, so the little ball will shoot off at three times the speed. And that is actually quite dramatic if it'll just agree to work. And it's quite tricky to release them because you know, it all shakes and they fall crooked. So what I'm going to do is burn the string. And that's a cunning way of cutting the string without disturbing anything. And what you must do is watch the little ball. Whee! There she goes! 
Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, that's it, people. Thank you so much. Don't forget to come next month, third Saturday. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.